If you wouldn't mind just turning to Psalm 46. This morning we have finished our series on revival. We spent six weeks. But of course the subject matter is not finished um, because we continue to pray and to seek the face of God. But I'm going to be sharing a message today titled A Very Present Help. A Very Present Help. Psalm 46. I'm going to just begin by reading the first three verses. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling torrent thereof. Sila, Sila. Well, Father, we this morning just want to thank you in earnest for thy great love, Lord. We thank you that we can be here this morning in the house of the Lord and that, Father, your goodness abounds without measure towards us. Please, I do ask now, Father, as we open your precious word, we pray for a word in season to our hearts. We pray, Heavenly Father, that, Lord, you would minister grace upon grace, that, Lord, we might hear, Lord, above all the noise and the clutter, Lord, perhaps that's going on in our minds, we might hear the clear sounding voice of the Saviour speaking to us through your word this morning. Lord, help me, your minister, that, Father, you, your grace might abound now. And, Lord, each and every one of us might feel the help of heaven. Father, help us is the cry of our hearts this morning. For we have no other refuge, no other place, no other safety besides thee, Lord. So hear us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. A very present help. They tell me that Christianity is for weaklings. Men with no courage, nor backbone. Christianity, we're told, is for those who need a crutch. But as for me and my house, we will stand in our own strength. Now, there's two things that I want to address as I begin this morning in the comments just made. On both counts, you will find them to be erroneous and flawed on every hand. In addressing the first point, namely that Christianity is for weaklings, men with no courage, nor backbone, a precursory glance through the history of the first 300 years of Christianity will serve to amend such talk in an instant. You see, far from Christianity being a religion of comfortability, those early believers were systematically persecuted first by their own countrymen and later by imperial Rome itself. As all hell was brought to bear upon them, you look and you read the history, go and check the annals, and you will see a church triumphant in the face of death. Who can forget the courageous manner in which that first martyr embraced the call, the holy call to martyrdom? Look with me please at Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Acts 7 and verse 
54. Uh, Stephen has finished his lengthy address and they listened for a season as he recalled the history of the fathers until he came to verse 51 and turned the gun on them. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And he continues to bring the cutting knife to bear upon the conscience. And in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice his departing words, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Oh, friends, I listen in vain to hear the screams and the cries and the pleadings that his life might be spared. I don't hear such language, but on the contrary, calm repose did mark his being, and like his master in meekness, he laid down his life freely, pleading that mercy might be shown his aggressors. Friends, you can't explain that. Outside of that, of verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost. Oh, we see the revealed source of Stephen's great strength and every martyr following after him. Oh, he led the way. He had his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, as an example. But he being full of the Holy Ghost. So I'd have you mark those words this morning. This is that for which our Lord promised in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And look, I'm not preaching this morning about theoretical fancies. This is the word of God. And the text tells us that as Stephen was laying down his life in preparing for martyrdom, but, and it's a great but, he being full of the Holy Ghost. You say, does that make a difference? That makes a difference. Jesus promised in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. And the Greek word there you're familiar with, I'm sure, dunamis. It's where we get our English word for dynamite. Power, dynamite. Jesus says, you shall, not you might, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. On the day of Stephen's martyrdom, those first to cast the stones were told, laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, Acts 7 and verse 58. And yet the irony is, he who oversaw the martyrdom of Stephen, who was hell-bent in destroying Christianity from the face of the earth, 
inspired by the devil himself. We're told that this same Saul of Tarsus would soon after be gloriously saved. And Saul the persecutor became Paul the persecuted. And the glory that he saw shining in the face of Stephen, he later wrote, abode in him. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul writes, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 7 through to 10. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yes, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. This is the testimony of Paul. You remember the words that our Lord spoke to Paul? He records them for us. So much of his writings is full of personal testimony because you see, Paul didn't just preach the things, he lived them. He walked with God. He knew what he was saying because he'd experienced it in his own life. And you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 how we have there recorded the words of our Lord as he spoke to Paul. Thrice Paul had pleaded that the thorn in the flesh might be removed and we're told what that thorn was, the messenger of Satan to buffet him. Buffet him through afflictions and trials and persecutions. And you remember the words of our Lord that echoes through the chambers of time. My grace is sufficient for thee. And brother or sister, this morning you may well stand in the place of need in affliction and trial. But I want to ask you the question, do you believe those words? That our Lord said to Paul and by extension he would say to you this morning, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, Jesus says, and the Greek for strength there is that word dunamis, my power, my dynamite power and strength is made perfect in weakness, in weakness. Now that's an oxymoron to the world. That's a curveball. Seems a contradiction, but for we who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we can say with the Apostle Paul, Amen. We can say with our Savior who said these words, Yes, Lord, it is so. And so Paul concluded in Verses 9 and 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory, will I rather boast in my infirmities, my weakness, that the power, the dunamis of Christ may rest upon me, upon me. And he being filled with the Holy Ghost, and ye shall receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me therefore I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities in need in persecutions in distresses plural for Christ's sake for when I am weak then am I strong. 
Now, time does not permit me this morning to chronicle the cruel manner in which the Caesars of Rome sent the early Christians into premature glory, beginning with Nero and ending with Diocletian. The first three centuries of church history was marred by the bloody stains of imperial Rome. You read the history. Get a hold of Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'll read some of it to you this morning. And you look at the heroes of the faith and you'll see that Stephen wasn't an anomaly. An anomaly. He wasn't an exception to the rule. But rather we see that those 300 years intermittently were marked by the stain of Christian bloods. Well, allow me please just to read a snippet to you this morning. Just a snippet of this history as recorded by John Fox in his famous book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I want to read here the first persecution under Nero, AD 64. And you see, I often think sometimes that, look, what's the difference between then and now? It's merely one of geography. Because if you would have been born in Pakistan or Iran or Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia, if you would have been born in most of the Middle East and the Muslim world, if you would have been born in communist Russia, China, Laos, Vietnam, then what we're reading about here is happening every day in the north of Nigeria as Boko Haram guns down whole villages. Why? Because they're Christian. Because they make the same profession as you and I. But you see, we live in England and we don't experience that kind of persecution. So we think, well, that's for a bygone day. No, it's happening right now. And I want to encourage you as weak men and women and children were able to embrace the most fiercest of persecutions through the power of the living God that came to rest upon them in their hour of need. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was given what for? That we might be witnesses, martyrs. That we are willing to testify to the glory and the risen Savior. And we're willing to do that with blood at the cost of life. He writes, the first persecution in the primitive ages of the church was begun by the cruel and tyrannical Nero. The sixth emperor of Rome in AD 67 this emperor reigned for five years with tolerable credit to himself, after which he gave way to the greatest extravagance of temper and to the most atrocious barbarities. Among many other diabolical outrages, he ordered that the city of Rome should be set on fire, which was done by his officers, guards, and servants. And while the city was in flames, he went up to the tower of Messinas, played upon his harp, can you imagine it? And sang the song of the burning of Troy and declared that, quote, he wished the ruin of all things before his death. This terrible con flagration continued nine days without intermission and when the tyrant saw that his conduct was greatly blamed by the people, he so managed to as to fix the odium upon the Christians, he blamed them, which gave him an opportunity of witnessing new cruelties. A furious persecution was accordingly commenced and the sufferings of the Christians were such as to excite the compassion of the heathens themselves. I mean, even the heathen, godless Roman citizens had pity upon the Christians because of the cruel and the fierce way in which Nero put so many of them to death. Some were sewed up in the skins of wild beasts and harassed to death by dogs. Others were dressed in shirts made stiff with wax then suspended on poles and set on fire in the gardens of the palace. 
This persecution was general throughout the whole Roman emperor, empire, sorry, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Besides St. Peter and St. Paul, they were put to death under Nero. Many of their most distinguished converts, whose names have not been handed down to posterity, were among the sufferers. That was A.D. 64, 67. The second persecution now allow me to read in A.D. 81 under the Roman Empire, Emperor Domitian. The Emperor Domitian was naturally cruel and after having slain his brother, he raised the persecution against the Christians. The various kinds of punishment inflicted were imprisonment, confiscation of property, banishment, broiling them upon slow fires, racking, burning, scourging, stoning, hanging, and harassing with dogs and wild beasts. Many were torn piecemeal with red-hot pincers, and others were thrown upon the horns of furious bulls. You remember the Colosseum and how the Christians were thrown to the lions. He records that it was under the reign of Domitian that the Apostle John was exiled to the island of Patmos, and Timothy was clubbed to death by an angry mob in Ephesus. You can't read the history of the church without seeing its martyrs, its heroes, men and women, even children. Finally, I'll read to you the 10th persecution. He goes through all of these under Diocletian. Historians say that this was the worst. Around the year AD 303, 303, Many houses were set on fire and whole families perished in the flames. Others had stones fastened about their necks and were cast into the sea. These are our brothers and sisters. The persecution extended into all the Roman governments, but more particularly in the eastern province. And as it lasted 10 years, 10 years, it's impossible to ascertain the number martyred, or to enumerate the various modes by which they were made to suffer. Many were beheaded in Arabia, many devoured by wild beasts in Phoenicia, great numbers were broiled on grid gridirons in Syria, others had their bones broken, and in that manner were left to expire. In Cappadocia and in Mesopotamia, several were hung with their heads downwards over a slow fire. In Pontus, a variety of torches were used. In particular, pins were thrust under the nails. Melted lead was poured upon them. But all these torments were to no effect. They couldn't get the Christians to deny the Saviour but rather more willingly they were ready to give their lives to testify what? That Jesus Christ lives and that he lives in them. In Egypt, some Christians were drowned in the Nile, others were hung in the air till they perished, and great numbers were consumed by fire. Scourges, racks, swords, daggers, poison, crosses, and famine were all used in various places to dispatch the Christians. Phrygia, a town consisting wholly of Christians, was surrounded by soldiers to prevent any from escaping and then set on fire, and all the inhabitants perished in the flames. Christianity is for weaklings, hey? Men with no backbone, we're told. For those who need a crutch, I don't think so. Bound by conviction were those early Christians. Bound by conviction. 
endued with power from on high, thousands, untold thousands, of courageous men and women and children embraced martyrdom, counting not their lives as dear to themselves, that they might finish their course with joy. In Revelation chapter 3, we read of a church that has just gone through great persecution, namely those in Philadelphia. And in Revelation chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8, our Lord begins his address to this church and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, These things saith, He that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the keys of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, our Lord says to this church in verse 8, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. In other words, I'm bringing you out of your trial, the Lord says to this church. I'm opening a door. And no Roman emperor, no man can close that door I'm bringing you out. Why? For thou hast a little strength. I love that. The little strength Christians in Philadelphia managed to endure the persecutions of the Jews in that day. Thou hast had a little strength and hast kept my words and has not denied, not denied my name. The Greek word here employed for strength, thou hast little strength, is the same word that we've been looking at throughout Dunamis. Church in Philadelphia, you, you, don't, you didn't have great Dunamis of your own ability, great strength and power. It's my job to supply that. Oh, that we'd only understand that. God doesn't want us to be heroic. He doesn't ask us to stand with human strength and to flex our biceps and to show our doggy determination. No, thou hast little strength, but endued with great strength from on high. That's the equation, that's the secret of the transaction, that as my strength runs to its end, the strength and grace of God begins. That's a beautiful transaction. It really is, and it's here told us by our Lord. Church in Philadelphia, you didn't have great strength in your own ability, but one thing you had in your little strength, you anchored your faith in me. You've kept my words and you have not denied my name. You kept my words. In the face of persecution, in the face of trial and affliction, you have not denied my name. You kept my words and for that the Lord commends this church. It's my heart this morning, brothers and sisters, to encourage you, to encourage you. Some of you are in fiery trials right now. Others of you, unbeknownst to you this morning, are getting ready to go in. I wish I could tell you it was some other way, but I can't. Because our Lord promised us a cross before the crown. And suffering before glory. Some of us want the glory now, but friends, we need to go through the suffering first. Read Romans chapter 8 and then we will be crowned. Some of you are in fiery trials and others are you, of you are preparing to enter in to fiery trials. But my word of encouragement to you this morning is hold fast and be of good cheer. God is able to bring you through. He is. With the whole history, whole of Christian history, to tell us this. God is able, able 
to bring you three. Now, the saints of old were convinced of this. You see, we go through various trials and we fail to relate it. We think, well, God, why have you allowed this to come upon me? But you see, God's preparing us in the smaller trials so that we can face the bigger ones. You don't just move from zero to ten overnight, but God prepares his people. And some of us are trying to cast off those trials and say, well, Lord, I don't want that, Lord. But God's saying that he's trying to prove himself in the small that we might be able to trust him in the greater. And you look at the resume of the Apostle Paul and you look at the sufferings that this Apostle endured. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just before where we read in chapter 12 of my grace is sufficient for thee, they're related. Paul has relayed the sufferings in chapter 11. He comes to chapter 12 and he tells us how he managed to endure it, though at first he's short for the Lord to take it away. In labors more abundant, 2 Corinthians 11.23, 2 Corinthians 11.23, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night in the day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, Paul says, and I'm not weak. Who is offended, and I burn not. Yet in all these things, brothers and sisters, the apostle Paul was persuaded, absolutely convinced the devil tried to beat Christ out of him and he couldn't because Paul was 100% convinced that no matter what the Lord would call him to endure and to embrace, his grace would see to it that he has the strength required to get through. Not in his strength, but in the dunamis power which came to rest upon him in his hour of weakness. And brothers and sisters, I want to ask you this morning, are you convinced of that? Are you? That the trials that should come upon us, there's grace to go through with God and that we don't have to lose hearts. Paul was persuaded. No trial, no affliction, no devil in hell was able to tear him apart from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I believe that. And you see, this is where our theology becomes experimental. Some would merely sit down and learn of God, but they never experience him. But you see, the two have to marry together. That I understand who God is from the revealed word of God, but then I'm called to experience this God through life. And one of the wonderful and one of the most powerful ways to experience the God of Holy Scripture is through suffering. It is. 
because it's there where God draws nigh to the broken hearted. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to bring some things out. I want to encourage you this morning. I'm endeavoring to prepare you, saints. I understand and believe in revival, but that does not preclude persecution. The church was birthed in revival and went straight into persecution. Saul of Tarsus, how about we have a Saul of Tarsus, you know, bent on destroying the church? The two are not mutually exclusive. God revived the church in North Korea, in China, sorry, in China, so that they were able to prepare for the persecutions that followed. In Romans 8 and verse 35, who, Paul writes, who, who, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Asks the question. Bearing in mind he proved it in his own experience. Shall tribulation, no, distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, peril or sword? Well, Paul just told us he was subject to all of this in 2 Corinthians 11. And his answer emphatically is, I'm still standing. And ultimately he would lay down his life if his head was decapitated, bearing witness to the loving saviour in martyrdom. As it is written, it should come as no surprise to us, those churches that are telling Christians, well, come to Christ and get your best life now. You won't have any problems. They're doing a tremendous disservice because Jesus Christ says the opposite. Oh, we'll have life and life more abundantly. Amen. But that will come through trials and persecutions and afflictions. It's written, he quotes Psalm 44 and verse 22, as it is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul says, there it is again, persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Do you believe in the keeping power of Christ? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. All God requires on our part is faith the size of a grain of mustard seed that will fasten itself like a barbed hook and say as Peter said, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life and on that conviction we cannot deny him. We cannot deny what we know in experience. We cannot deny the one who saved us and redeemed us with his precious blood. We can't. And so we trust him. And in little strength, God supplies his great strength and enables us to go through. Paul begins with the love of God in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? He ends with the love of God in verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Midway through, he parks momentarily for a pit stop in verse 37. The love of God. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him, 
through him that loved us. I want to say this morning, I want to say, brothers and sisters, I've said it before and I say it again, and I didn't coin the phrase, theology matters. So if there's one thing that I could get home, it would be that this morning. Theology matters. A church weak in theology will be weak in living in experience. The kind of God with whom we have to do matters. What we believe about God matters. Matters. Look here in Romans 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. In other words, we didn't just stumble accidentally into the kingdom of heaven. We didn't trip up one day and find ourselves Christians. Before eternity passed and the world began, the Lord foreknew you, called you, justified you, glorified you. That's theology. Understanding the plan and the purpose and the wisdom and the mind of the Lord. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Imperial Rome, do your best. Persecutors, do your best. If God be for me, Paul writes, then who can be against me? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? who also maketh intercession, intercession for us. Do you see what Paul is doing here? What Paul is doing? He's allowing theology to make sense of his circumstances. He's trying to put his sufferings into perspective into context with who God is, the plans and the purposes of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we must always begin theologically. Don't allow anyone to ever despise or to disparage theology. Friends, if you don't understand who God is, how on earth are you expected to serve him? How will you stand in the hour of trial? By his grace, yes. But our faith in what kind of gods? Someone who's getting a kick out of watching us suffering? Someone who has lost control of the steering wheel? Someone given to mood swings? It might just be that he woke up in a bad mood today and I'm getting the brunt of it. Who we understand God to be matters. I understand that he's immutable, so we cannot change. I understand that he's love and there is no darkness in him at all. So that allows me to understand that I'm going through this trial, but the love of God, as Paul writes, the love of God is for me. How we understand God and 
who him to be matters. Our conviction of faith must be anchored in who Christ is. I want you to consider with me again, please, the introductory remarks of our Saviour to the faithful church in Philadelphia. We read it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Please turn there again. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. We're coming shortly to Psalm 46. The Lord begins with theology. Theology, the study of God, who he is, is basically what the word means. His attributes, his characteristics, his holy, his love, his mercy, his grace, his kindness... His favour. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, saith he, number one, that is holy. Number two, he that is true. Number three, he that hath the key of David. Number four, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, I know thy works. See how our Lord introduces himself to a church on the back of persecution, coming out of it shortly. The Lord begins by revealing aspects of his character that they might not lose heart. They can have faith in a God who is holy, righteous, and the one who is true, who cannot lie. The one who has the keys of David, it's another way of saying the sovereignty of God, that the one with the key, when he opens a door, no power on earth can close it. I don't care whether you be the president of the United States of America, who can stay the hand of God? He's the one who has the keys of David, that authority, that royal authority. He opens and no man shuts, he shuts, and no man opens. And with that knowledge, I'm able to endure the trials, knowing that God is a holy God, knowing that he's true to his word, knowing that all power belongs to him, and he's able to bear me through. The church in our generation is so bereft of the knowledge of the character of God. As soon as trial comes upon them, they're off. Offended. I didn't sign up for this. What kind of God allows his children to suffer? Have you read the New Testament? Have you read what Jesus said? Void of the knowledge of God, and that's why we have a generation of pygmy Christians who cannot endure the slightest of persecutions because they won't draw near to God. Because how can I draw near to a God who allows me to go through this? What, so you're charging God with evil now? Though the scriptures say in him is light and no darkness at all. He tempts no man with evil because he himself cannot be tempted. So no matter what I'm thinking, that thought just has to go. Because it's alien to the word of God and thus it's alien to the character of God. And I cannot allow that to sit in my spirit, but rather I'm going to feast on who God is which in turn will allow me to draw near to him. The love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the holiness of God, the truth of God, the justice of God. Oh, as I meditate and ponder on these things, I run to a God like that. And though I might not be able to make sense of the circumstance I'm in, one thing I know is that he has the keys of David. 
And in due season will open that door. And when he does, no man will shut it. And he will shut the door in his season. And when he does, no man will open it. I love the words of Paul. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18. Can I encourage you this morning, child of God? Get your eyes on the Lord. Get your eyes on the Lord. And in order to do that, you've got to look up. You've got to look up. We heard our brother pray this morning of the future glory, of the joy that one day these sufferings shall be, open, be over. And in a twinkling and in a moment of an eye, I will be transported into the glorious presence of the Lord. Oh, to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Our light afflictions, Paul says, is but momentarily, and it's working in us a far, far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while our eyes are not on the things we see, but on the things yet to come. And so in closing this morning, turn please to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. We will close with this this morning. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear. Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Where does the psalmist begin? He begins with God. The very first words committed to paper, God. I love that. The very first word in Psalm 46, verse 1, God. So much of our theology today begins with man. It's so man-centric. It's all about man. Man, man, man. You see it expressed in so much of the songs of worship. It's all about man. Friends, when you begin with God, when you begin with God. We'll come to man shortly. But the psalmist begins with God. God. God is our refuge. A very present help in trouble. And that one statement sets the course of the rest of the psalm. Beautiful. Oh, sometimes we just need to allow the word of God to minister to us. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. God is our refuge literally means God is our shelter. Our shelter. That place where we can run to and find a covering of safety. We're running here, there, and everywhere. The psalmist tells us God is our refuge if we would but come to him. Running the opposite way, run to him in the time of storm. 
put some flesh upon this text in personal experience. God is our refuge. God is our refuge and strength. That word strength is, you read it in the Septuagint, bearing in mind we're dealing with Hebrew now, but the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The LXX it's called, 70, because it was believed that it was compiled by 70 men in Egypt. And this was the Bible, if you like, um, 250 years before Christ, as Greek culture permeated the society and the diaspora where the Jews had been scattered and didn't return and made their homes in Babylon and in Syria and the like, the Septuagint. Well, as you read that verse, Psalm 46 and verse 1, what do you think the Greek word here is for strength? Dunamis. Dunamis. God is our refuge and power. Dunamis, our strength. A very present help in trouble. Not just help in trouble, man. Not just present help, but a very present help in trouble. Very present. You say to me, Brother Paul, what does that look like? Well, imagine being alone on a mountain range and suddenly you stumble. You're on the edge of a clear face. You could have the best high-tech equipment available to man. You could have a personal lifeline, if you like, right into the White House. Personal hotline to the president. But it's not going to be of any avail to you in that moment because you suddenly have slipped unprepared. It may be of help after the event, but not in the immediacy of the moment. Well, the psalmist is telling us that in the moment of our stumbling, when trouble is upon us and we stumble and our instinct is to stretch out our hands, God is there. A very present help in trouble. He's there. He's there. Does your theology allow for such a grand concept? God, you don't know what I'm going through. He's omniscient, omnipresent. He's a very present help in trouble. This is, if this is who God is, then friends, I just want to tell you this morning, and this is where the challenge comes, it, it ought to affect us. We say, Lord, I believe that, but when the trial comes, we show by our actions we don't believe that. Because we're running around like headless chickens and bouncing off the walls. If we understood this, and then we would calm our soul for a moment, and we'd say, steady your nerves now. Let me remind myself of the God with whom I have to do. That I might have lost control, but God hasn't lost control. He's my refuge. He's my strength. And he's a very present help in trouble. This ought to affect us. Knowledge like this, friends, has to, has to translate into a therefore. A therefore. You see, the psalmist can't just stop at verse 1 and leave it framed someplace in a museum. But this has to act out. This has to be experienced. And so he says, therefore, on the basis of verse 1, on those grounds, therefore, we will not fear that God, if this is who you are, and I believe that is who you are, a refuge, a shelter, a strength, a very present help in trouble, then Lord, I'm going to allow that to do something to my life. And on those grounds, I'm not prepared to fear, therefore, we will not 
fear, says the psalmist. It cannot remain in the chambers of the mind, but must work itself down to the corridors of experience. And friends, God is bringing this church on in experience. I understand it's painful sometimes. I understand it's not the best of news to know. Here I go again. But brothers and sisters, it's God's remedy. It's God's means. It's God's method of allowing us to experience theology in practice, of moving it down from here into the Christian life. And that's where God would have us. Therefore, we will not fear. You know, fear is a terrible crippler. Fear has the potential to render a man mindless, to paralyze a soul. But in the light of the revelation of our God, our refuge, our strength, a very present help in trouble. Because this is so, the psalmist says, we will not fear. Now look, fear has differing degrees and I'm finishing. I understand that many of you precious sisters fear those crawly eight-legged invertebrates. And perhaps there's some brothers amongst us who are scared of them as well. But if we were to be woken out of our sleep in the middle of the night unexpected by a magnitude eight earthquake, I don't think the fear would be comparable. I mean terror, terror. As the ground opens up and houses go missing and cars are swallowed up. You see, fear has differing degrees. And the psalmist goes straight to number one. He bypasses all the intermediaries. Fear of spiders, fear of heights. And he just goes straight to the top of the list. What kind of fear won't you fear, psalmist? on the grounds of the knowledge of who God is. Though the earth be removed, that's some earthquake. The ground opened up and the earth just disappearing beneath. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, could you imagine such a spectacle? Now look, the psalmist is either lying or he's telling the truth. Though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, just carried away as the earth opens up and just disappearing into the ocean. Though the waters thereof roar those huge waves like tsunamis, the aftershocks, and be troubled. And though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Therefore, will not we fear. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Oh, for men and women that could testify it so, that could run in the hour of trial and say, oh, here's an opportunity to prove God, to gain a testimony, to come and to encourage the saints and say, it's as God said. He's who he said he was. He promised to keep me and he has. He promised that I would not be moved and he gave me strength to stand. And by that same token, I want to encourage you, brother, sister, the same God that kept me can keep you also. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Think on that, Selah, pause. Meditate, ponder. This would have been a song. 
Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still now and know that I am God. I'm not hurried and busied like you. Absolute control of the situation. Absolute oversight, absolute care. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Now I don't know all that you are going through this morning. But what I do know is that which is twice spelt out in this psalm. Verse 7 and 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, for if he be not our refuge, then what refuge do we have? God is a very present help in time of trouble. And it's high time, brothers and sisters, that we put this truth to work in our lives. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you this morning for the challenge. We thank you this morning for the encouragement that, Lord, you're bringing us on. You're moving us from the school of learning, Father, into the field of application. And, Father, I understand it's painful, Lord. But, oh, what a joy to experience you, Lord. When all of the help fails, your help will never fail, Lord. When all of the strength fails us, the God of Jacob shall be our refuge, Selah. And so I thank you this morning for this word that has come in season to our hearts, to keep us now in the midst of and to prepare for some of us, to prepare some of us for perhaps what lies ahead. Lord, keep us now, we pray. Lord, not in our strength, but in your strength. As we choose to put faith the grain of the size of a mustard seed, and to fasten the barbed hooks of our faith upon you, Lord, being fully persuaded of who you are, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.